it is just a huge, unbelievable honor today to be podcast interviewing a legend in dentistry. I was born in 62. You graduated from dental school in 58, and you did so many first things in dentistry. You have one of the most amazing stories. And I've always, I've, I've met you so many times over the last 30 years, and you're just a down to earth. You've always been a father figure to me, Bill. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Oh my God, I better look at my jeans. Oh my God. <laughs> I, uh, I remember one of the, fir the, the first time you ever saw me lecture, I walked off stage and I shook your hand. You said, is that you or are you on drugs? You were, you were dead serious. And I said, what, what do you mean am I on drugs? He goes, he goes, you are so hyped up and rambunctious. I thought, oh my God, yes. I thought, man, that's a hell of a performance when you walk off stage and uh, the older dentists think you're on drugs. Let me read your bio <laughs> just because uh, there's someone living under a rock who might not know who you are in uh, Kathmandu. Uh, Bill graduated from Temple University School of Dentistry in 1958, the beginning of the new age of dentistry. He spent over 40 years at the dental chair. During those 40 years, he has been uh, fortunate to have created Centrix and been part of the team that has created many firsts in dentistry. Some of the products that you may recognize are the CR syringe with disposable tubes and plugs, the Mark III power handle syringe for composites, the preloaded capsules for light activated composites, the bend, br bend -a brush, <coughs> the first totally disposable brush applicator, also, needle tubes for the placement of dental materials into difficult areas, Encore paste, paste core, paste formulated to work with the needle tube, Tempet, a preloaded variety of temporary stopping materials, Super Cure, a light activated core buildup material, also in a convenient capsule package. Recently, Bill has developed the DS Desense Crystal, a one step desensitizing solution packaged in. A easy dispense syringe with a soft needle. The soft needle is a sponge tip needle to apply the desense crystal without scratching or damaging the tooth or tissue. Also, Bill has developed no mix temporary crown and bridge cement along with the convenient take home emergency package for your patients. Last but not least, this month he is introducing Gingy Track, a silicone based formula, no cord retraction system. There were, uh, there were and are many other products that they offer to the dental profession. But why, where, how, and when did these ideas and products develop? Wet finger dentists encounter many situations working every day at the chair. As dentists, we have great advantage in recognizing opportunities that everyday problems present to us because we are intimately involved. What a wonderful chance to create new and exciting way to change the way dentistry is practiced and advanced in art and science. Necessity is the mother invention. Who put the dentist has this great opportunity to innovate. After five or six years, uh, I'm, this is first person from you. After five or six years, I was unhappy and depressed with my first dental office and the patients that were there. I was in a rut, so I began to think of possible ideas that I could patent that would make me rich so I wouldn't have to be a dentist anymore. Today, I guess you would call it burnout. I therefore came up with my first patent, a syringe for rubber base. It was no better than the syringes already on the market, an expensive lesson, but a nice certificate. This didn't stop me. I started to dream up ideas that had no connection with dentistry. I dreamed up candle patents. I next received a patent for a convertible chandelier, another product that I had no business trying to develop or market, but he got a chandelier patent. I eventually learned the hard way after spending a lot of money on patents, prototypes, and trying to sell my ideas. Bill, what a legend. You are just an amazing legend. How are you doing today? Well, I'm exhausted after listening to you just now. <laughs> well, That's fantastic. You know... Uh, it's been a long time, and it's been a very interesting experience to be a dentist. I enjoyed uh, dentistry. When I came out of school, boy, did I think I knew everything. <laughs> you know, it's just like typical dental school. You come out, you think you know everything, then you find out you don't know anything at all. It's amazing. Do, don't you think some of the best companies in dentistry were the ones all started by what glove dentist? I mean, whether absolutely, absolutely. You know, who knows the problems of a dentist better than a dentist? Their spouse. <laughs> well, they're was, the ones that was, complain. Was, Why aren't you home? What, was, How come you're working so hard? Is that a trick question? So Did I get it right? <laughs> Why aren't you working so? Why are you working so hard and everything? Well, trying to make a living, that's why. I think dentistry is one of the hardest professions there is, both physically and mentally. I'll tell you. 
I, uh, I feel that, especially when I graduated from school, standing up at the chair was normal. So I learned doing standing up dentistry for 40 years. It, it really is much better today. And uh, the things that we had to use and what we used back then, I mean, we can't do what a dentist can do today. We didn't have the materials, you know. Our best thing was gold. Our best thing was uh, acrylic veneers. You know how good they were. So you've been uh, doing this. You graduated in 58, and it's 2016. So you've been doing this 58 years. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> and and what would you what would you say to these uh you know these podcasts are consumed mostly by dental students and kids yeah. under thirty, um what do you think is the biggest change you've seen in dentistry in fifty eight years? My God, there have been so many changes. I can say that the materials have changed radically. Changed. I think the porcelains have changed radically. Impression materials have changed radically. Uh, the digitalization that's coming about, with especially with the x-rays, I think is marvelous. I, I just can't imagine what it's going to be in the next 10, 15 years. It's going to be like a new world, really. I, I, but I think that a lot of the work that uh, the dentist does at the chair is going to be coming from the improvements are going to come from dentists because they have the problems. They know the problems, and somebody is going to get up there and figure out how to make it better, make dentistry easier. I know that when I started uh, my first idea in dentistry, was it came out when uh, composites were first coming out. I don't know if people don't realize it, but 3M had the first composite in 1965. It was called Adent. And it had a great color, as long as you like gray. <laughs> you put it in the front tooth. Now you was, said you said that was the first composite. Yeah, it was Eight? called Ad Adent. Yeah. I thought it, I thought it was Adaptic. No, that came about three four years after. Wow. But Adent was the first composite. It was made by Dense uh, 3M, and it came in a foil pack that you had to keep in the refrigerator, and you had to open up the pack. And you had to cut off a little piece and put it in the tooth. And you, you cured it with a light. But it was only gray. That was the color. As long as your teeth were gray, it was a perfect match. Do you, do you think you have a photo of it somewhere? I might. I might. Uh, I remember that, but uh, I if definitely you, If you remember. find a photo, email me that, Howard at Dentaltown.com. I want to paste that because I, I did not know that. So the first composite was made by 3M. In 1965, right. called a dent, and it came a in a foil dent. packet. Right, right, and it was a couple of years after that that three uh, J and J came out with Adaptic. Now that was the first paste paste Adaptic uh, composite that came out, and it was had a chameleon effect, so that they only had one color, one shade, and it was such a radical improvement from the old silicate impression. Uh, materials that we used to use because they were good for maybe two years and then they'd wash out. But the adaptive came out and I, I started using it when I had uh, changed my practice and moved from uh, Southport, Connecticut to uh, Stanford, Connecticut. And I was an associate there with uh, a prosthodontist, Jack Buckman, who did all, all dentures. And he used to buy everything new. He bought everything. I mean, we had stuff in the drawers that you couldn't believe. But he bought the Adaptic, and I started using it, and it was great, great stuff, except it was hard to put in the tooth. So I was pushing it in like we used to do with all the silicates, pushing it in. So I came up with the tube and plug and a syringe, and that's how it started. And you invented that? Yeah, I came up with it because... I didn't have a tool to put the stuff in the tooth. I couldn't fill those small holes. So that was so the I, birth of Centrix? Yeah, that was the first part I took. I had, I had to make a mold. I had to make a prototype mold. So I took $6,000, and I, 
which was all the money I had, to make a one cavity mold. <laughs> so I I put the money into it and I said, well, what give year it a was time. that? Uh, sixty nine. Nineteen sixty nine. Nineteen sixty nine. Beginning, maybe it was even late sixty eight too. I started fooling around with it. And when when did you start the company called Centrix? Seventy. Nineteen seventy. Well, Where did that name it. come from? Huh? Where did that name come from, Centrix? Because I think of the well, Centrix syringe. Okay, you know the Centrix relation in dentistry, oh. the starting point. I just took Centrix relation, Centrix, and I changed the last word to X, Centrix. Wow, I did not know that. I, I oh wow, that is so that is so interesting to find out. <laughs> well, you know. I tried to sell the product to a lot of the big companies, but nobody was interested. So uh, I really believed in the idea, and I thought that composites were the future. That's what I believed. Back in 1969-70, so I decided I was going to sell it myself. And I decided to uh, build a bigger mold. So I took, <laughs> I, had to, I had to go to the bank, and I borrowed... $12,000 from the bank, because I had to do this all myself. Now, my wife was generous enough that she never complained. So we bought this mole. We bought this 12-cavity mole. Guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work. You have a boat, Howard? No. Oh, that's too bad I have an anchor for you. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so I I had to go and work with a an engineer, and I had to design a machine to make the the little tube because the two the mold that I had and the way we were making it couldn't make it, so we had to make a machine to actually make the top part. Fortunately, it worked, and we were on our way, so we could sell. And it does make dentistry a lot easier, too, because now you could stick that composite right into the bottom of the hole, fill it up, you don't get any voids. You mentioned that um, these were the first composites to replace silicate. When did silicate come out? Do you remember the first one, the first oh, silicate? Oh, God. I remember back in uh, 50, 54, when I started dentistry, they were make it, mix it quick and mix it thick. You had to get a cold glass slab to keep it slow. So you had to mix it quick, mix it th thick. That was it. I don't remember when silicates came out, but they were they predate they predate even me. So are you that's thinking, a long time. <laughs> and you started in '58. So what do you think? Was it still in the '50s, or do you think it was World War II? Do you think it was '45 era? I bet it was. I'll bet it was. It goes way back. A lot of people don't realize that uh, that uh, temporary uh, Cavett, the temporary, yeah. that actually what? came from uh, the Nazis in uh, World War II making a, a field dressing for a, a, a toothache. I believe it. Yeah, it's a great product. It's a great product. I think it's packaged wrong. I think it's better to be packaged like we package uh, a version of uh, Tempet which is in the tube, pre-dosed in the tube, which is a lot easier. You don't ruin the whole bit because when I was using Cavit, I'd open up the tube and in a couple of days it would get hard as a rock. Couldn't use it. So now we package it in the little tubes and it's good for the whole time. You know what's uh, funny is in uh, music and dentistry, you keep seeing these uh, old-time products uh, or you know, someone will remake a great song from the 70s and these kids today are loving this song and they don't realize that, you know, that's a 30 year old remake. It's interesting how so many dentists my age, I'm 53, are going back now to uh, zinc phosphate cement. I know. Because when they're cementing these crowns, all these fancy new resins and you can't see the flash and it's causing all these implant problems. But zinc phosphate cement, you see it so clear. But they all come back and they say, um, but my assistant complains because she's spoiled on these, uh, these quick, easy cements and mixing uh, zinc phosphate cement on a glass slab is not making her happy. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you invent a faster way to mix zinc phosphate cement? Have you thought about that? 
Well, you know, the hardest thing I could I could think of is getting away to accept the, the capsules that they have for glass ionomers. That'd be about the only way you could do it because it's very difficult to uh, proportion powder and liquid to get it to work right. Very difficult. And you want to make dentistry easier. And the best way to do would be to put zinc phosphate uh, cement into one of these capsules that they use for glass ionomers and things. Why don't you do it? Well, maybe we should. Well, you maybe sh- we you, should. You should do it. Uh, we just had Carl Mish on a podcast for two and a half hours who says, you know, it's, it's zinc phosphate. You can see it on a radiograph. It's antibacterial. It, you know, That's and, right. And he, he's telling everybody to go back to that. He doesn't like these new fancy. He says every dental cement on the market that says it's used for implant, he wouldn't use himself. And, uh, and, and he, he's wrote the textbook that, that we all read. I mean, it's what, in its eighth edition? I, I know it would be a hot product right out of the gate. Well, I, I could believe it uh, because it is a pain in the neck to mix it on a pad. But if you do mix it on a pad, uh, you could pick it up with a bender brush and wipe it into the tooth, too. But it's better off if you could have it in a capsule, no question about it. Well, then, uh, can we go on the record and say that you're going to have this product released <laughs> by the end of the year? How about for my birthday? My birthday is August 29th. Why don't you, you have time to have this and send me the first scarpule for my birthday? I'll send you a carpool. I don't know what's in it, though. I don't guarantee. Hey, you know, well, you know I would be very careful with that. I, uh, I, I want to, uh, I, um, no disrespect to you at all. I love all your innovations. I love the cosmetic revolution. I love it that when uh, people get all tooth colored fillings, they all look whiter and brighter. But it's funny, old school like me, in my mouth, I have seven restorations. They're all gold, it's gold. with zinc phosphate cement. Sure. Um, the, do you, I still think that's the gold standard. Do you? No question about it. No question about it. Uh, when I was practicing, I was fortunate enough to uh, meet and, and befriend Peter Thomas. And I seen Charlie Stewart and I knew all those guys and everything they worked in was gold. And I've seen work done by Peter Thomas in my associates, my prostodontist mouth. Peter Thomas actually put in this case. It was all gold long lace, everything. I've never seen something as beautiful as what he put in his mouth. It was absolutely gorgeous. And and when I saw that, I realized that I didn't know anything because the occlusion, the carvings and everything in that mouth was absolutely exquisite. It's like Michelangelo came down and did that work. It was just beautiful. And we practiced so long, we saw the gold get wiped out by the porcelain fused of metal. And now right. we're witnessing the death of porcelain fused of metal. That's going extinct faster than the dodo bird. It sure is. And I can remember the porcelains we used to use. They were so fragile. That and, and building them up and the, these new zirconium and everything else out there, it's marvelous. It's really amazing. But I wonder how good it's going to last compared to gold. I, 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 there, there's no beating gold. I know, I know uh, guys like you are old school and don't like to self-promote and are shy and humble and all that, but, but promote yourself. What, what is the best-selling products at uh, Centrix? What, what Centrix... <laughs> Centrixdental.com, C-E-N-T-R-I-X, dental.com, coming from the name Centrix Stop. What is, what is your, your uh, like, like a dentist, if you said, what do you mostly do? He'll say cleaning, exams, x-rays, fillings, crowns. What, what well, are you our, mostly selling? What's mostly hot? What's got you excited? Okay, I'll tell you what we have. What we have right now, we have the Access Crown, which is, I think, one of the best temporary filling, uh, temporary crown material on the market. It's, it's got that little bit of uh, resiliency, a little elasticity before it sets. You can take it out. It's real nice. Good color. Everything about it. It's about as good as you can expect. What's it called? In a temp- Would you co- repeat the name? Access Crown. It is really a nice uh, product. The other, the other thing is the Floridose. You know, now here's a product that is so good 
for the children, for the young kids coming up. I mean, you and I, I don't know if you saw the change when we went to fluoridated water, but the change in the kids from a mouth that used to come in, you used to just point your finger and you could have a day's work. And the kids today don't have that, except now with all the bottled water that they're drinking and the sports drinks that they're drinking, we're starting to see, I think, a resurgence of decay. What do you say? What do you think about that? Absolutely. Um, you. That's why I'm. Um, I was. I was a dentist. I got the Arizona Award from the Arizona State Dental Association for get, helping uh, leading. Uh, to get Phoenix four day in 1989. We had to do it 20 years later. And what I saw, what I see with water fluoridation today is all the poor kids in poor areas and apartment complexes living in the projects. They, they, they're still like me. I grew up drinking out of a garden hose in the backyard, but <laughs> all the, all the middle class and the rich, they're all on bottled water, reverse osmosis. And, and, uh, you're, you're seeing, uh, you're, decay. You're, yeah. Yeah. You're seeing decay. It's, it's a shame. But we have, but the Floridose is, is a very good product, and it's rated top, top uh, fluoride product, fluoride product. But we have some exciting stuff coming out. I, I want to go back to your access crown because um, sure. some of my homies might not have understood. That's a uh, bisacryl composite for provisional crowns and bridges. It's, it's, provisional. It's, yeah, it's, Absolutely. A, it's a temporary. Yeah, what's temporary, though, Coward? Uh, you know, uh, life is temporary, too. I, people used to ask me, they used to ask me, will this work? Will this last all my life after I put in a, some dental work? And I said, oh, if you promise to die within two weeks, I'll guarantee it. <laughs> it's, it there's no, nothing is permanent. Nothing is permanent. When, when you talk about um, uh, a temporary crown, you know, I'm old school. We were all taught at UMKC that you solve all your problems in the temporary, you know, before you impress you you know you prep yeah. you temporize you have everything right. like you like it you might find out you know three weeks later you need to lower the margin or this or that and now you're seeing about 12 to 14 percent of dentists going to these uh same day crowns with cad cam what, what what are your thoughts on the the digital cad cam revolution well i guess there's a place for it i mean if you want to spend your time uh in the laboratory because it's not quite as easy as the salesmen like to uh, promote. I mean, you just can't go in and uh, take a picture and go back there and, and hit the button and they cut a crown. And it does take time. It, it's not, you know, it's, it's not instantaneous. So a lot of them are probably going to go to digital impressions or regular impressions, send it to a laboratory. Well, I, I tell these people buying a CAD cam is exactly like buying a Steinway piano. You can buy the nicest piano in the world, but then you're going to sit it. on it and not play a damn note. And it's going to take you, you're going to have to commit 10,000 hours to oh, master yeah. that thing. So the question is, is that where you want to spend your time? Absolutely. No, I, I, I'm from the old school and uh, computers and everything else or not my thing. I got to admit it. I'm, a, I'm an old fart. Uh, it, it, it just sometimes a little too much. By, you know, there's too much electronics, too much. Every time we have a phone, you can't go anywhere without being called. You got to be bothered. People call you. It's ads of this and that. It's really almost too much. There's no time just to sit around. But uh, I think it's funny when you go to a restaurant and you see the table next to uh, it's a mom, dad, two kids, and everybody's staring at their iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. I know. It's ridiculous. But, you know, we see a big change in dentistry now. We're starting to see a lot of women. You know, you're going to have 50%, at least 50%, I think, in dental schools are women. Now, that's a radical change from when I went. How many, how, many women, how many were in your class size? What dental school did you go to? Temple? Temple. And you graduated in 58. How, how big was your class and how many were men? We had 124, 125 in our class. And the men were 125. There wasn't one woman? <laughs> Not one woman. Do you remember what year the first woman made it uh, into Temple? Yeah, probably when we were a junior. 
there were a couple of women in the lower classes. I don't think there were more than a half a dozen women by the time I graduated that were in the class, the four classes. And do you think it was hard, for, it was psychologically hard for them to go into an all-male institution? No, no, I don't, I don't think it was too hard. Maybe some of them thought it was too hard, but I think most of them, uh, they were struggling just like we were. I, I, I think that you and I can't weigh in on it because we're men, but I do want to say one thing to my homies. I have heard so many times and read so many emails and, you know, I'm still out there lecturing, you know, four or five times a month. Yeah. And they tell me, especially in small rural areas, that they, they go to the study club. They're the only girl in there, and they, they feel like uh, they're in an all-man's deal. And, and um, four or five are over there. Maybe they're saying an improper joke, whatever the heck. But I want to remind my homies that, you know, if you're, if you're in a small town in Texas and there's 12 of you and some young 25-year-old new graduate female dentist comes in, you need to go out of your way to make them – feel welcome uh, because I I'm hearing the feedback that a lot of them feel like they're, they're in the wrong place that they're, they still feel like they're in an all male profession and we just need to nap that in the butt. Well, I, I, I look at the enrollment in the schools and the enrollment is about 50%. So it, it's got to change. It's got to change. I think uh, the, it's a pretty darn good uh, profession for women I think I think that they have an easier time establishing a private practice rather than men. I think it's much easier for a woman to establish that. Men, I think, are a little bit more difficult. But a woman that brings out the mother, you know, the motherly instinct in the, and they can attract people, and they're great for pediatrists. As far as I'm concerned, if I never worked on a child, <laughs> it would be fine with me. Well, Bill, when you and I, uh, when you were in school, all the gynecologists in school were men. And now men uh, is basically extinct in gynecology. That's and true. And I am predicting the same thing with pediatric dentistry because I'm just looking at the graduating class. Almost every graduating class or every pediatric program I've run into, it, it was all women. So, All women. So uh, men are rapidly disappearing in pediatric dentistry. It might be the first profession. It might follow gynecology because mom makes all the appointments. And who do you think mom can't feels more comfortable and trusting and be able to ask questions with a woman or a man? That's true. That's very true. I think they they have a better rapport. Absolutely. They really do. Yeah. And you know what and I love most about women dentists? The most? The very that? most? You know, I, I've lectured in every continent but um, Antarctica. And uh, when you go into the United States where there's no money, like in teaching, it's, it's all women. Yeah. And the men are always in military, insurance, banking, finance, movies, video, where all the money is. And when you go to the rich countries, the men are, are all dentists. But when you go to the countries where there's no money, just like education in America, it's all women. Yeah. And, and you find these women just working their butt off with two or three other girls and, and they're doing it. And they, they basically, I, I had one woman in Kathmandu tell me that uh, she's fortunate because her husband has um, given her, covered the $50 a month loss for the last 20 years. And I'm like, this woman's working five, 10 hour days treating all of her village and she's losing fifty dollars a month, and she does it from the heart. I mean, I, I, I did. I, I cried. I just, it's just so beautiful to see people doing it for the right reasons instead of doing it because they for want to the make money. six figures. Yeah, it's true. But you know, all through my practice, I've always, I've looked at doing things a little easier. You know what I hated the most? What I really hated the most in dentistry was packing cord. Now, I'm going to be a heretic and say I really hated to do that. And like uh, Gordon says, to pack two cords is much more than I could ever do. I could never get it. Some of the tissue is so hard. So I worked on a lot of uh, ideas uh, to get away from packing cord. And I, I put a lot of stuff into uh, developing non-cord retraction systems. I, I developed a, something called Retrack a long time ago. Long time ago. And then Exposil came out and everything and 
<laughs> sort of, uh, we came out with ginger track and everything, which is a, a silicone based retraction material. But uh, something I got to tell you, we've come up with something brand new that we're going to come out with. It's going to call it, it's a new impression material. It's called No Cord. It's an impression material that takes an, imp an impression without using cord. So we're looking forward to uh, making a little dent in that. So who, who are your uh, dentists, your key opinion leader dentists that uh, um, go out there and lecture on your stuff or, or make CE? or? Greg Kurtzman is one. Hey, I want to ask you another thing that um, you've seen. The, uh, you, you came out and uh, gold was the, the best, was zinc phosphate cement. And uh, then it went to PFM. We talked about that PFM is just plummeting. I mean, it's totally being replaced. Another thing you watch the, um, is amalgam. What, what, what do you think of um, what do you think of these young kids? A lot of them come out of school and they say, well, you know, composites last longer than amalgam because they bond oh. the whole tooth together. No, not, not true. I mean, that's <laughs> crazy talk. It is crazy talk. Because amalgam, I remember putting in the amalgams. I've taken amalgams out there. They're probably 50 years in the mouth. And, and, then, and then they look at that and they say, well, see how it's cracked the tooth and there's recurrent decay. And then I say, okay, well, show me the recurrent decay. And then they take out the amalgam and they, sh they show me this black scuzz. I'm like, dude, did you take biology? I'm pretty sure the black scuzz doesn't have any DNA in it. It's not dividing. It's, not, it's black scuzz. And it's been in there half a century. And you're saying that it's cracking the tooth? And then they, yeah. they want to replace it all with composites. So, so – Based on your seeing this for 62 years, how long do you think the average amalgam in America lasted versus the average posterior composite lasted? Well, you know, uh, what the insurance company pays for or what it really lasts. I would say a, a good amalgam in a mouth that's well-maintained could last 25 years. Not a problem. I don't think it probably could last longer. A uh, composite, if it lasts 10 years, I would be surprised. So then what do you say to these kids who say, well, amalgam expands and contracts a coefficient of thermal expansion is greater. It cracks and breaks teeth. And if you place an MOD, amalgam is going to need a crown. So thus, I choose an MOD composite to bond the whole tooth together. What would you say to that statement? Well, I think that the composite does extraction, uh, compression, expansion and contraction too. I, I think that... If it's not put in right, it can crack a tooth very easily. Because I, I know I've done it. I've cracked teeth with composite. I could actually see the cracks develop. So I, I think it's not quite true. I would rather keep the amalgam. If, if you want a long-term restoration and you want it, you're not interested in the cosmetic fact that it's black, I, I would We'd go with the amalgam or gold. Gold. Yeah, and I, I agree. Um, I agree that uh, um, I, I don't think you should offer it to women because every unit of time you explain the advantage of amalgam to a composite will be a complete waste of time. I mean, it really will. You got to manage people, time, and money. But for posterior occlusals on kids, on boys who wear the same shirt three days in a row, don't use soap. <laughs> you know, I mean, he uses. Same underwear for three days. In yeah, a yeah. I mean, I, I was, uh, yeah, I mean, my gosh. I, I, to, to do cosmetic dentistry on molars on boys who don't brush or floss or care, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, I just, it's just, it's so confusing to me. Hey, you have a lot of products that have the, uh, that have been uh, reviewed very highly by the dental advisor. Um, yeah. Talk about the dental advisor. Do you, do you know that guy or? Uh, who is it now? Yeah. Uh, what's it, John, John Powers. Powers? John Powers? Is it Powers, yeah. John Powers, yeah. Well, we have, a, we do give them our products because it's nice to get a, a, a not bipart, you know, a nonpartisan of a you know, do you, read. Do you, do you know him? I, yes and no. Tell, tell, tell I'm him, not personally. No. Tell him I want a podcast interview him because I, I, I see his work. I see his ratings. I think I, I should bring him on the show and let him tell everyone what he's doing. Why, he should. You know, he's not a dentist. He is a, uh, 
I guess a chemist or a, a physicist or whatever he is, and he just happens to work in the dental field. But yeah, he is not a dentist, so he's pretty impartial to what happens. And they have a lot of dentists that test the products too. So yeah. we we do send them uh, their products, and we send it to uh, clinical research, uh, Gordon Christensen's uh, group too. In yeah, matter of I fact, think, I, I think you're the same age as Gordon, aren't you guys? You're both 82, aren't you? <laughs> well, Gordon's a little younger. No, I don't think so because. I lectured with him. We were both on the same program. I was Friday. He was Saturday in Pennsylvania. It was his 80th birthday, and that was a couple of years ago. Really? Yeah. yeah. I remember. I, I, lectured, I lectured with him on the weekend of his uh, 80th birthday. Well, he's in better shape than I am, though. So. Well, those so Mormons, they, they don't drink. They don't drink what? or smoke. They, they, I said he's Mormon. They don't, that's all that clean living. Well, that's probably true. They also didn't have an automobile accident when he was, when I was a young man. Did you get an automobile accident? Oh yeah. You never I told me that story. Tell, tell me the story. I smashed up. I was going. I was in the service, and I was uh, going back to my base in uh, Florida from my home in Connecticut, and I was driving this uh, yellow Austin Healey. You probably, you remember an Austin Healey? I do not. Okay, well, it was a I'm little sorry. yellow sports car. And in North Carolina, I lost control on a wet road, <clears throat> and I slid into a ditch and hit a tree, and uh, I got catapulted out uh, about 50 feet out. I tore the windshield. I tore the, tore the uh, steering wheel off, uh, and I landed in the ditch about 50 feet away from my car. We didn't have any seatbelts back then in 59, 59. And uh, fortunately, there was somebody behind me. They were nice enough to stop. And otherwise, I'd be a bag of bones in a North Carolina swamp right about now. So did you have uh, permanent injuries from that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You were I, in the Air Force, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, w I ended up uh, spending six months in Camp Lejeune in the hospital there. I ended up with two steel rods in my left leg and uh, a cracked back. So uh, this is catching up to me right about now. That's all. Huh. So, Well, you look great, and I uh, every time I see you, you look great. You're still doing great. Well, I, I keep trying to come up with new stuff all the time, Howard. And really, our, our new products... I think are going to make a nice dent in dentistry. I mean, it's going to help dentists. We've got a new product called Heat Sleeve, which, you know, in order to make composites today, which are very, very hard, very, very tough to get out of the, comp out of the capsule, and they're making the capsules bigger and bigger holes so that you can squeeze the material out. So what we've done is we've got a device, which is a, we call it a heat sleeve, which is you put on the uh, composite into the, your syringe, slip it into the heat sleeve, activate it, and it gets to about 127 degrees, warms the composite, and we have some composites now that reduces the viscosity by 90%, 90%. And with a lot of the women today, it's harder to squeeze the composite. It makes it easier, and it flows better. And we've taken uh, MRIs of teeth that we fill with a heated composite versus non-heated composite, and you could actually see voids in the non-heated composite so that it makes it flow better. It joins better with less voids in the restoration. Well, now I know how I'm going to make my millions. Remember that lady? Remember that lady went to McDonald's, bought a hot coffee, spilled it. In oh, my lap? Ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a heat sleeve, drop it in my lap, and then sue you for, for, for uh, pain and suffering. It, uh, it can only help you. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> it'll warm up your heart. Believe me, Howard. So talk about your no mix temporary cement. Well, the no mix temporary cement is, is a great product because. Just like the word, I guess I'm uh, very creative with the name, 
First I got no mixed temporary cement, then I came up with no cord impression material. So <laughs> I'm really on a no tear. But the, the cement is really good because it, it really is a basic <laughs> calcium sulfate kind of thing. It's really plaster of Paris. And of course it's gonna be uh, pretty karyostatic and, and bacteriostatic too because of the calcium sulfate. It's a, it's a basic material. But the nice thing about this is we're packaging it in little tubes that the dentist can give to their patients. And when the patient goes with a temporary, you know, calling you up at the middle of the night, my temporary fell out. If you give them to say, open it up and <laughs> glue it in yourself. But it's also great if, you're, if you have patients or people going away on vacation. You know, I had a, a problem. We went on, I had a one cruise I went on, one cruise. Second day on the cruise, at breakfast, I bit into a bun, a roll, and I broke off my lateral. <laughs> I crowd, broke it off and tried to get the, the ship to use the facilities. It was a dental tour, it was a dental convention on the ship. You know how they are. And we went there, and they would not let me use the dental chair or borrow their cement. They would not. And I had a big fight with the, uh, the nurse that was on there. She just wouldn't let me. Use. She said, well, what's it going to do? What, what's going on? And, and this was Holland America. I'll never go on Holland America again. They said, well, that's just for the crew. I said, well, what happens if you got a toothache? She says, well, we'll give you some antibiotics and we'll make an appointment when we get to. I said, I'm on a cruise. I'm going to spend my time in a dental office. I, all I need is a little cement, for crying out loud, to glue it back together. But they wouldn't do it. So fortunately, one of the other dentists had some phosphate, zinc phosphate cement. And I was able to, to uh, stumble through but that was a terrible experience. I'm telling you, if you make that zinc phosphate cement in a uh, mixing carp, yeah. like amalgam or glass on or whatever, it's going to be a hit. Yeah. yeah I think, I think, I think. Can I quote you on that? What's can that? I quote you on, can I quote you on that? Actually, you can quote Carl Misch. I mean, he's, he's, I mean, Brandmark and Misch, I mean, that's the two biggest names in implantology. And Carl Misch uh, is, uh, that, that, yeah, that's his, that's, true. that's what he wants them all cemented with. Is Brandmark still around? No, he passed away. He did pass away. He passed yeah. away. I, uh, um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to podcast interview his son in uh, San Francisco. Um, but uh, yeah, he passed away. He what? What a uh, my gosh! Would you do you think that that was one of the biggest things you saw in your career in 62 years? Dental well, implants you know, replacing I, three to bridges. I did. I did some blade implants. Do you remember blade Absolutely. implants? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> the most traumatic thing I think I've ever done to that poor patient. I, I took a, a scalpel and lower and I opened it up, the tissue, and then you take a 557 burr and you just channel, just zoop. Then you take this wedge, put it into the channel that you drilled, and you take this mallet. You take a mallet and just like banging it, it was. I'm never. <laughs> Did you ever do a ramus frame or a subperiosteal? No, I wasn't that adventurous. <laughs> I wasn't that adventurous. But hey, but go back to that day because I want to remind all these uh, dentists are, uh, you know, um, all tribes are very hard on the on any member who thinks outside the box or tries anything new. But oh, that's all, true. All those, uh, the dental tribe back in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, what did they think of those dentists that were pioneering implantology? Were they Are you nice? kidding? Were they kind to them? Oh, absolutely not. Oh, my I God. Mean, they they took were... their licenses away. They bankrupted No, they their... didn't, but they. I, I, I saw, I, I, I can give you names of dentists who had their license taken away. Really? Yeah, because they would do all these cases, and the first one that failed, the board would say, my God, you're a quack. What are you doing? I know. And they'd take their license away. I know. And, and now this entire industry that everybody's talking about surgical guides, they don't realize the pioneers. And the reason I keep saying that is there are pioneers out there today saying things 
and they're they're you know they're they're, they're tortured they're they're thrown away and 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 humans need to be more open minded to people in their tribes that aren't listening to the same leaders or wearing the same costumes or doing the same rituals you know it's true well they say what is it the uh, uh the prophet is not in his own land he is no respect what is that saying now yeah the, the, yeah it's it's true i mean dentistry has changed and it will change some more too it, it always does has to because you got to make dentistry easier cheap like gordon says easier cheaper quicker you know i didn't you know i didn't see coming out of school that the three unit bridge would go the way the implant i didn't see uh, I, that um, amalgams would go extinct and, and half the dentists wouldn't even have it in their office. I didn't see so many things. But I'll tell you one thing I thought I would see and I didn't see is, you know, in 1900, the average life expectancy was only in America is only 47. And now, yeah. you know, um, and it was mainly from antibiotics and vaccinations. I thought I would see a vaccination for streptococcus mutans and PG gingivalis, just like the way they did it for measles, mumps, polio. Yeah. Did, did you think that, that those two – gram-negative faculty of anaerobes would be vaccinated in 58. Do you think you'd see that in your lifetime, and are you surprised you didn't? Well, I tell you, I never thought about it that way because, you know, the way people are with how they take care of their mouths, they do or they don't, the what they eat, the what they drink and everything, I, I, I don't know if that would ever happen, that you could get a vaccine that would eliminate that. Maybe. But what would uh, Procter and Gamble say? Where would the Crest <laughs> and Colgate go? I mean, you, you know, when you look at them, there's all their toothpaste gone. So that's that's a big money thing. You wonder, you wonder about that sometimes. Maybe uh, you think they would fund something like that. I want to ask you another question. You got a lot of young kids coming out that say, "Hey, Bill." Howard, you guys graduated in the golden years. It was easy for you to come out of school and open up your own practice. I'm coming out now in dental school, $350,000 in debt. There's corporate Thank dental you. chains on every corner. Uh, what, what would you say to that young dentist coming out of school today? Do you think there's as much opportunity in 2016 as there was when you got out in 58? It probably is, but it's different. It's totally different. It may not be in a private practice and it may be in a group somewhere, but there is opportunity because you can do so many other things in dentistry now. I mean, there, the, the problem I see with that is the tremendous debt that these guys carry. It, maybe what it does, it makes them look at the dollar rather than at the patient sometimes. I've heard where uh, some of these corporate dentists thing, they have a quota where they have to produce so much. Now, are they producing what's needed or are they producing things that just to get the money? You know, it, it's, it's a tough thing when you have that kind of debt. That's a lot of pressure on a person. I know. I got to make that alimony payment every month. Oh, 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 oh. my God. I got a quota to make. Or I'll, I'll, you got a quota to make, quote and you make. better make it too. So, so you you invested six thousand dollars in nineteen sixty eight to in twenty sixteen. That'd be worth uh, forty one thousand eight hundred sixty two dollars. I graduated from dental school in eighty seven eighty seven thousand dollars in student loans. Today, that would be worth a hundred eighty six thousand. So, uh, you're uh, um, so yeah these these so I guess uh, if you're walking out of school three fifty, I was one eighty six. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think, why, why do you think dentistry is going to follow, uh, physicians? Um, I, I think physicians consolidated a group because of the cost of their equipment. I mean, but to buy an MRI, to buy a CAT scan, to buy all their equipment, you couldn't buy it for one person to use it 40 hours well, a week. What do you think? Well, you know, why do you think dentistry has to consolidate? Well, because a dental office is like a dental hospital. You got to have all these materials. You got to have the good X-ray. You have a cone, a cone beam now today. If you're going to be doing implants, or, it, it's just the expense of setting up an office without joining other men, other people. Well, okay, here. When I went to school, you said you were in debt. 
my tuition in dental school was $450 a year. <laughs> wow. $450 a year. The reason I went to Temple and not to the University of Pennsylvania was because Temple was cheaper. University of Pennsylvania was about $1,100 a year, but Temple was $450 a year. And when I graduated, it was still $450 a year. Now, when I see what the guys, young students are paying now, it's just mind boggling to me. I, I just, I, I don't know if I would be a dentist today, to tell you the truth. The uh, investment is so great. What's the return? You know, it's very difficult. Right on. So, um, by the way, to my homies, uh, no one pays me to be on my podcast. There's no advertisement. This is like HBO. It's dentistry uncensored. We say whatever we want. But my, uh, my, when I meet dentists who are founders of dental companies, especially of your um, um, age range, they're just not self-promoters. Like Bob Ibsen, you couldn't get him to talk about, you know, uh, remember Bob Ibsen? Oh, sure. He, he passed away Dr. Two weeks Orlovsky, ago. he, Dr. Orlovsky, and Henry Lee were actually the three people that started composites. Who, who they were made, the three? Who were the three? Dr. Jan Orlovsky. Spell it. Bob Ibsen and Henry Lee. Henry Lee, These, Bob Ibsen. What was the other name? Dr. Jan Orlovsky. Can you spell that? What's Jan? Y A N? Y A N is good enough. O R L A F S K Y, I guess. Yeah. Jan were, those, were those all three dentists in the same area around Southern California? They, well, they started uh, making Adaptic. They uh, made the original Adaptic for Johnson and Johnson. Really? Mm hmm. They were the. The three wise men that made the first adaptics. And they were all dentists? No. Uh, uh, Henry Lee was a chemist or a physicist. Jan Orlovsky was a scientist, a chemist. And Bob Epson was the dentist. What year do you think that was? 68, uh, 67. Yeah, that was so sad, uh, Bob passing away. He was a visionary, wasn't he? He certainly was. He was. He came up with some great products. Now, were you guys good buddies since you both had dental companies, same age, all that? Was it was no. it a friendly competitor or is it more? Oh uh, sure. Oh yeah. We never. Because you had some rough dealings with Densply back in the day. Yeah, that was business. That's because uh, the head of Dent Supply at that time just was a pig-headed and didn't want to make any kind of uh, arrangement with us or anything. Who was, it was that? Just, huh? Who was that? Oh, Jesus. Uh, Burt Borgel. That was before my day. Oh, yeah, before your day. I before loved John Miles when he was the CEO of Densefly. Do you remember John Miles? Yeah, sure. He had the biggest boat in Chesapeake Bay. Did you know that? <laughs> no. It was the biggest boat. I mean, that thing, it was just a monster. <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about boats. That's not my not my thing. Not my thing. But uh, yeah, we we had some problems. We had problems with with a lot of people because it was patent infringement time, you know. What would but you, that's what, all past. What would you uh, What would you uh, credit Bob Ibsen with? I mean, what would your uh, What would you say? What would your words of summarizing Bob Ibsen's uh, career in dentistry? Well, he was he was really a fork. He could. He really had foresight. He could see stuff. I mean, the products that he came up with. I remember some of the things he came up with was a product of the week too, but they were different things. Repairing porcelain, blah. It was a lot of things the same, but he did a lot of great stuff. He Who, made a great composite. Who's that? Uh, that uh, lady around you that I saw at the very beginning of this uh, podcast helping you with the Skype. Debbie. Tell Debbie. Debbie. Get, get, drag Debbie around the corner so I can see her. Is she still yeah. in the room? Yeah, she's right here. Hey, Debbie, come here. Debbie's here. I posted on dental. On de Hi, how are you doing, Hi Debbie? There. 
I'm, I'm going to tell you because I, I want to get this done. On Dental Town, we have uh, 50 categories, and one of them is uh, uh, news and information, or whatever. But it has obituaries, and no. I just posted the uh, obituary for Bob Ibsen uh, two weeks ago. But I wish you would uh, register uh, Bill Dragon on Dental Town and post a deal because that's uh, you know that's going to be up there for thousand you know if it makes it to the internet it'll be there forever but you need to say that bob ibsen henry lee and yon um were the inventors of composite with adaptic for johnson johnson uh dental dental history is amazing and and so many of the greatest legends in dentistry like bob barkley you know he oh yeah he he died but he didn't make it to the internet i i don't have any videos i don't there's nothing of bob barkley i can put on dental town or youtube or LinkedIn or Pinterest or whatever, so that a thousand years from now, you know, the neatest thing about Facebook, there's 30 million dead people on Facebook. And when we were little, <laughs> when we were little, mom would drag us to the, the graves of our grandpas and everything, and all you'd see is two numbers and a dash. Well, yeah, that's it's right. hard to relate to a dash, but now, now, you know, a hundred years from now, your kids will log on to Facebook and go to your profile and say, my gosh, my great, great grandfather was an alcoholic dentist. And, uh, <laughs> because every picture he's Speak for a, yourself. He, he's yeah. a, well, it's so funny because so many people, you know, every time they post on Facebook, they're out for dinner with a glass of wine in their hand or a beer or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's a very important. It would be, it would be so meaningful to me if you posted that, uh, you're crediting Bob Ibsen and Henry. Yes. Lee. I'll tell you, uh, you know, so many guys that did so much good for dentistry, like uh, Henry <clears throat> Stollard, uh, Stewart, Peter Thomas, these people, you know, in nethology. Uh, were you into nethology by Absolutely. any chance? Absolutely. And same thing with Peter Thomas. I mean, is, is, there, is there any videos I could digitize? Is there? I I have his picture. That's about all I have. I know. Uh, that he sent me, but uh, he had the biggest ham hands I have ever seen in a guy. He was like a bear, <laughs> and he <laughs> did the most beautiful work I have ever seen. It just un unreal the work that he did. And another guy I I knew, uh, Art Khan. I don't know if you've heard of Art Khan. These are the old guys. They were all mythologists and beautiful. Beautiful dentists, I'm telling you. But, you know, I've seen some of the dental work that's done today, and it is pretty damn nice. I, I think you've got some guys out there with golden hands. That's what we used to call the guys that were real good, guys with golden hands. And you know what you should also be doing? Do you know why I named that website Dental Town instead of Dentist Town? No. When we started, uh, when we started Dental Town, dentists would get mad because uh, – people who uh, worked in dental manufacturing were getting on there and they're saying, hey, they're trying to sell something. We're just dentists. And I say, well, are you, are you a volunteer dentist? Do you work in a homeless shelter? Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you're charging your patients uh, money for a thousand bucks for a crown. But um, I think um, so many um, so many dentists are, are, are saying on Dental Town every day, what they want, what they wish their product did. I mean, so if you logged on to Dental Town and all the dentists are saying, you know, everybody makes it red and we just want blue. That that's that's your key to sit there and just say, oh, we need to make it blue. You should go out well, there and post and say, I'm Bill Dragon. I've been doing this 62 years. If if there's something that you need to do better, faster, cheaper dentistry, let me know. That's why I did well, it because. But well, you know, a lot of guys. A lot of dentists with ideas do contact us, and we have purchased ideas from dentists because nobody knows the problems of a dentist better than another dentist. And, you know, I went through a lot of aggregation with legal crap, and I don't want to do that to any of our dental colleagues. That would be the last thing I would do. I would rather tell them to go to a different company. I would never try to steal something from another dentist because- I know, I know. Dentists always may want me to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure. Yeah, contract. I know. Like, yeah. Like, whatever. Um, how, how do my homies contact you? If they got an idea, how do they contact you? Well, they can call, uh, they can call me on, uh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> something here. Uh, That's well, right, what's, what, I, don't, I have no idea what's going on. What's your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, for if, if one of the listeners wants to talk, has Better an idea. Contact me on my email. That's okay. D-R, D-R-A-G-A-N. That's one word, Dr. Dragon. That's D-R-A-G-A-N. There's no O in Dragon. No, dra- no O in Dragon. So is Dragon like the monster, O-N or A-N? Owen is the monster. Okay, so you not... is the error and Ann is the terrorist. Okay. <laughs> Real? okay. Is that true? At, yeah. At centricsdental.com. So it's Dr. Dragon at centricsdental.com. So is your name uh Dragon? Is that what what would you say? It it, it means Well what what it, what's what does the name Dragon mean? It, well, it's actually a, it's a Romanian name that I found out. It, it's a it's a lot of times uh, you have people that their first name is Dragon. So it, it's, I don't know, but my parents probably were from the Ukraine, but they could have migrated, you know, over the years. I had my DNA done uh, a while back to see what kind of the background I come from. And I guess it's finally confirmed. I'm two and a half percent Neanderthal. So you got to be careful. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny, and and that's uh, interesting thing about the Neanderthals is they uh, I forgot who they went to war with, Girl Magnum or whatever, but uh, they they wiped them out and extinct them. But fifteen percent of their DNA is uh, Girl Magnum, so they were marrying them, eating them, and killing them. Yeah. <laughs> they get the DNA all the way. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because people, uh, you you hear these kids whine about how their parents didn't raise them properly. And I'm like, well, their grandparents didn't raise them properly. And their great-great-grandparents, and you go all the way back to Neanderthal Cro-Magnum, you're just lucky your dad didn't eat you. <laughs> so quit whining about your imperfect childhood. At least your father didn't eat you, right? <laughs> but, hey, Bill, um, seriously, you're my idol. You're a mentor. All my well, homies love you. You're a great guy. Um, you know, I got to say something about you, too. I think your dental town has been one of the really great innovations for dentistry. Because, like I told you before, when I got out of school and I was starting practice, nobody would help you. They would, they would try. They were very jealous, protective of their own. They didn't want you to uh, know anything. If you had a problem, they wouldn't help you. But Dental Town has really opened up the dentist so that the guys get up there, and they get put out their problem, and they get help. They get help. I think that's wonderful, and I think you've done a hell of a job. Well, thanks, buddy. I really buddy. do. Thank you I so mean, much. It is. It, my, my last question to me, your, your la- my last question. Is that really your son? Because he's about a foot taller than you. <laughs> how, how tall are you and how tall is your son? Well, we used uh, well, he's what, about 6'2". Six two? Six two, yeah, he's about 6'2". I used to be 7'2". <laughs> are you shrinking? I, I shrunk a lot. Yeah, I think I'm about 5'6 now and, and going lower. Too. You're 5'6"? You're I'm 5'7". And how tall is your son? 6'2"? Six two. So did you feed him some new modern fertilizer or something when he was a little baby? Well, actually, we live in the country, and he probably was walking in his bare feet out there with the deer shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, tell him I said hi. I think the world of your son. I think he's a great guy, and, uh, man, he's got some big shoes to follow with you. Thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you for giving me an hour today talking. Uh, um, it's been a lot of fun. Well, a lot uh, of fun. All right. Well, hey. I really appreciate it, Howard. Well, Thanks. the honor was all mine. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Be well. Now, now I'll give you over to my six-foot-two son, Ryan. Okay. <laughs>